was born in Toronto, and it's been home base all my life. I'm not quite sure why. Primarily, it's a matter of convenience, I suppose. I'm not really cut out for city living, and given my brothers, I'd avoid all cities and simply live in the country. Toronto, however, belongs to the very... So as I said, one of my favorite documentary, Glenn Gold Toronto from 1979. But how did you meet Glenn, and uh, how was the process? Well, Glenn Gould was already a phenomenon. I met him over the telephone uh, a few years earlier while I was at the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, directing uh, films. Uh, and one night at three o'clock in the morning, my telephone rang and it said, uh, uh, Mr. McGreevy, I hope I'm not disturbing you. Uh, it's Glenn Gould. Um, I saw a film of yours earlier this evening and I want to congratulate you on it. I thought it was a work of genius. However, you clearly are not a musician because no musician would dare take the risks that you've taken in that program and I just urge you to keep it up. That was my introduction to Glenn Gould. Then we became more interested in one another and he would call me from time to time uh, again three, four, five o'clock in the morning and uh, I remember specifically when he completed his 90-minute radio documentary on Leopold Stokowski he phoned to tell me he had just completed it and would love me to uh, hear it sometime and I said I would be delighted. He said well I can play it for you right now over the phone. And so at five o'clock in the morning, he played 90 minutes of Leopold Stokowski over the phone. And when we came to the end, I said, Glenn, it's a work of genius. Don't change a thing. And I hung up. Slow. You, well, you know, another thing that we can do, we can just sort of discuss one area at a time and stop tape and then, and then talk about it a bit. And if we think of something else we'd like to say, yeah. go back and do it again. Right. That's, that's a very flexible way to get to What's the first one? This interview between uh, Glenn and Leopold, uh, and he asked him about uh, aliens and stuff like this. It yes. was very, very funny. Mm -hmm. And he didn't expect that he asked some sort of things. And uh, what do you think about it? It's kind of well, and he, he, he gave that extraordinary answer that was just magic, you know, sheer magic. And Glenn, of course, was a pioneer in what came, became known as contrapuntal radio, where he had multiple voices speaking at the same time. Uh, the uh, idea of North, is, to this day, is seminal in the use of radio. It's a remarkable piece of work. And Glenn, of course, genius musician, was interested in other media. And uh, they, we began our discussions uh, along those lines. He became interested in the process of making a film as I was interested in the architecture of music. And we enjoyed years of discussion about uh, how different people achieve their effects. He had a tremendous, curious mind, was mentally articulate and knowledgeable about all sorts of things. And it, for me, was a, not only a pleasure, but it was a growing experience. I listened to uh, pieces that I would not otherwise uh, listen to or didn't even know about. And Glenn introduced me to works of Richard Strauss, the early, uh, the late Richard Strauss, the four last songs, which uh, are among my favorite, and other composers. Absolutely absurd. Some people say this is Toronto's answer to the Galleria in Milan. Whether that's true or not, it sure ain't your average Mont Blanc kettle corner store. It's called Eaton Center, and it's the flagship of a vast retail empire, which despite its size, has always been a family concern. We talk about uh, <coughs> your documentary, your amazing documentary, Glen Gould's Toronto. How much has the city of Toronto changed since you shoot the documentary cities? Oh, fundamentally, I believe right now there's more construction going on in Toronto than any other North American city. Glen wouldn't recognize it. Not that he particularly knew Toronto when we made the film, but what has happened now it become a mega city and I had a very simple idea to get launched. I wanted to do a series of films on great cities around the world with a major personality presenting their own city 
I began with Peter Yusinov in Leningrad, and Melina McCurry in Athens, and I always knew that I would want to approach Glenn Gould to do Toronto. But you had to be very careful with Glenn uh, how you made the approach. It was when I completed the film with Peter Yusinov that I called Glenn and uh, said, uh, Glenn, I'd love you to come down and see a film I've just completed. He said, well, I'd love to. Uh, what is it? I said, well, I'd rather like to surprise you with this one. Because I was used to sharing my work with Glenn and he loved these invitations to come downtown and watch what I was up to. And then we would have long discussions about it. So he came down and into a film house and up came Cities, Peter Yusinov's Leningrad. And Glenn leapt up and he said, I know exactly why you want me. You want me to do Glenn Gould's Aurelia. Now, Aurelia is a small town about 100 kilometers north of Toronto. And I said, Glenn, no, not quite, uh, but we would love you to do Toronto. John, uh, do you have any anecdote uh, when you worked on uh, the documentary and when you worked with Glenn? Well, yes, many, uh, because working with Glenn was always fascinating, because you never knew what he was going to come, come up with next. When we uh, agreed to do the film together on Toronto, he asked me, Uh, if he could have a script. And I said, yes, all right, Glenn. And then he said, well, how many words should I write? And I said, well, a 50-minute film like this has about 7,500 words. But knowing you, if you wrote 10,000 words, we can always trim back. And then I went away and shot another couple of episodes and I came back and uh, Glenn uh, was on the phone to me immediately. He said, well, um, I've done the script, but uh, it's a tad long. I said, well, it's all right, Glenn. We agreed that you could go long if you had to. No, he said, while I was writing the script, I became fascinated by the architecture of Mahler's uh, Ninth Symphony. As you know, with Mahler, there's nothing, you can't take a single note out. And similarly with the script. I said, Glenn, how many words have you written? He said, 45,000 words. I said, Glenn, well, there goes my, the rest of my series. <laughs> That was typically Glenn. We then enjoyed a marvelous relationship making the film, and uh, some of the moments in the film are only things that Glenn could have come up with, such as singing Marla Leader to the elephants as they came out of their cages early in the morning. Uh, it's touching scenes like that. Only Glenn of this, his wonderful personality, would pull something like that off. He was very happy about the working relationship and I enjoyed very much working with him. And of all the films in the City series, the one that we have more requests for, uh, for screenings, is Glenn Gould's Toronto. Thank you, John, for uh, your contribution today. And uh, I'm so thrilled and so happy to have you here uh, for uh, this great interview. I have a lot of questions and we can continue for all this uh, beautiful afternoon. Um, a last thing, uh, uh, your favorite, favorite, favorite uh, piece played by Glenn? Well, it is the final aria of the second version of the Goldberg Variations. It is so hauntingly beautiful, and it's almost as if he is saying farewell. He would occasionally say, I wonder when I die if anybody would show up. And he also said, I would like to be there just above the altar and looking down and seeing who would come. You know, and of course, it was no question that uh, the whole city and the world became affected by the loss of Glenn Gould. Thank you so much, John. And, uh Hope to speak to you soon again. Thank you. Thank you. I suspect that some of the appeal that Toronto has for me is gained by default, so to speak. I tend to follow a very nocturnal sort of existence, mainly because I don't much care for sunlight. Bright colors of any kind depress me, in fact, and my moods are more or less inversely related to the clarity of the sky on any given day. Matter of fact, my private motto has always been that behind every silver lining there's a cloud. So I schedule my errands for as late an hour as possible, and I tend to merge along with the bats and the raccoons at twilight. And Toronto's a pretty good place for that, because unlike many cities in America where the exodus to the suburbs has met a total decay at the city core, Toronto's maintained some pretty vital neighborhoods downtown. In fact, American visitors are always quite surprised that you can walk these streets at night, virtually all night, and um, not get mugged. And it's true, you can, although I still prefer to drive them, I must admit. 
the problem is, of course, that there is a certain stylish self-consciousness about all of this. I would like to think that the urge not to conform, the urge not much to care whether we're up to date with New York or Paris or whatever is supposed to be latest in the fashion mainstream, that that will always be part of the Toronto character. I would like to think that, but I'm not really sure that that's so. I hope it's so. But I'm afraid sometimes that our good press has gone to our heads just a bit.